Hello, everyone. Russell McCoy Max here. It's uh, just making a couple of adjustments. It's been a crazy day here, but hopefully you can hear me now. I see we've got 17 people already in the stream, which is awesome. Um, I'm going to pull up the questions I was, was bringing. Mainly, the question that started today was about uh, magic potion isopods. It was a question from uh, here. I'm going back to the comments now. Okay, I was in the wrong spot. Sorry. Uh, it was a question from Sandy Sizemore, one of our patrons. And Sandy wanted to ask why magic potion isopods were named magic potion isopods. And so I decided to do a little bit of uh, research on that topic. And it was pretty fascinating what I found out. Um, so we're going to talk about that in just a second. I'm going to see who's in the uh, chat here. Looks like we've got the Mossy Tavern, Maxwell Aquino, Jillian Bearden. Oh, spiny ice pods are awesome. Moon over Miami, Frank the Tank, Revelicious, Noah, Dor, Supreme Gecko, Ashley Neville, Erica Kim. Newt Scamander, Insane Isopods, Tip Top Taylor, Snailantologist, Jacob Markenton, Eileen O'Donnell, and Jody Althlet, is that how you say your last name? That one, Plant Guy, Thoropods, Magic Hamster, Zach Weinall, Limber Lost Exotics, awesome, Christian Borg, Brent's Pet Paradise, we got a nice group here today, 30 already. Well, um, so Eileen, you didn't miss it. Um, parts of mountain time, which is confusing, parts of uh, the mountain time zone have daylight savings time and parts don't. Uh, my part does, so um, that may help actually. So Jamie Kellerman, yep, yeah, thanks for popping in. And thanks for the background. This is actually a real background, check it out. It's well, you know, real in the sense that it's fabric behind me, which is kind of fun. Um, German 667, awesome. Offalet, okay, cool, got it. Oh, nice, first decays brown snake. It was Sean Meister, been a while, nice to see you here. So, um, the question from Sandy Sizemore was about uh, magic potions. And I have some uh, video clips we're going to look at, and we're going to look at my magic potions live, too, if I can get my uh, technology to work the way it's supposed to. We're going to do that. So first of all, to answer the question about uh, why exactly magic potions, where they got their name, well, I know who named them. The American line of magic potions was named by uh, Kyle Candillion of Roach Crossing. I did a little research into that found uh, a post by Kyle, and then found a little bit more about the origins of magic potions. And I'm going to show you a video clip, a video clip about that uh, in just a second. But uh, so Kyle Candillion of Roach Crossing, in around 2016-ish, somewhere in there, uh, he got some ice buds from someone else. That uh, And that other person is Jay Fiore in Georgia. And Jay collected some very unusual isopods um, local to him. I think he said it was in a flower pot or, or under a flower pot, something like that. And I should have checked my, uh, my uh, Facebook feed because I, I contacted Jay and he was uh, kind enough to give me some more information on them. And uh, basically, he collected some. Let me see if I can actually pull that up and Get, get his exact words, but he collected some, and not only did he collect uh, magic potions, or the precursors of magic potions, he also collected some other very interesting um, isopods. He said, under a flower pot in his front yard in Savannah, Georgia, that's where he collected them. So that's where the American line uh, originates from. And let's look at the video clips of the uh, some of the other ones he collected with them. Unfortunately, these others didn't prove out. Both he and Kyle were working with them, and uh, some of them either uh, 
died out or did not prove out, and so they weren't able to keep the lines going. Of course, the magic potions lines are, are still going strong, but these others weren't, but there's some pretty fascinating ones in there. I don't think it's going to let me play the audio. I mean, it's not going to let me talk while I show this clip, but just check it out, and then we'll talk about it. Okay, here comes the clip. So pretty interesting stuff there, as um, I hope you were able to see. He said there were some pied individuals. I showed the pied individuals first, where they had large sections of the body that were pale in color. Then there were some, there were some cappuccino kind of colored isopods. And he said that didn't necessarily show up as well on uh, film as it does in real life. And then he also said the, uh, the white butts. Both he and Kyle really tried to get the white butts going, but for some reason, they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't breed true. So unfortunately, those were lost to the hobby. But uh, just because they wouldn't breed true, like many other uh, morphs or attempted morphs will sometimes do. So sad that we lost them, but very, very interesting indeed. Uh, and I'm glad that Jay was uh, willing to share those photos with us. And uh, so what he did is he separated out some of his original magic potions and got them to Kyle Candelian of Roach Crossing, who continued to breed those. And he's the one who gave them the name magic potions. Now I have been in contact with Kyle, but as you may have noticed, he was in our uh, live stream as a guest not too long ago. And when Kyle was here, we didn't talk specifically about magic potions, but we did talk about a collecting trip that he was doing in Florida. And so I don't think he is answering emails right now just because he's out doing that and or or just you know finishing up that trip, something like that. And I sent him an email to ask him about the inspiration for the name Magic Potion. So I'm hoping to hear more about that um, from Kyle when we communicate next. But in the meantime, we know that Jay Fiore collected the original individuals and started the line of American uh, Magic Potions from some he found in his yard under a flower pot in Savannah, Georgia. So there you go. I thought that was kind of fun. Um, and now we're going to look a little bit at my magic potions. I'm going to uh, do some technological wizardry, hopefully here, if I can, uh, so that we can switch cameras and get a look at uh, my magic potions while we talk. So just a second here, Let's see if I can get this to work. Okay, hopefully you can hear me. I'm hearing myself echo, so just a second. Okay, how are we doing? Are we unmuted? Sorry, I was able to uh, mute it. Uh, I was muted there for a second, I think, but am I back? Let me know if I'm back. I'm really hoping that I'm back now. I appear to be back. Oh, inverts and oi, you should get some. Okay, 
Good. So I appear to be back. Let's let's take a look at some of these uh, magic potions. This is, like I said, this is the Japanese line of magic potion. And the other day, I was looking in here. And if you follow me on Patreon, and now Instagram, because I posted on Instagram a little later than I did on Patreon, like a day after or something like that, I found some Japanese magic potion uh, monkai in my colony for the first time. So this, this strain... I've had since October, I think it was. Let me check the label there. Yeah, mid-October, and I hadn't had any mankai as of last week's live stream. But now, they're showing up. Look at the markings on the, that face. They're almost symmetrical. I love that. And how is the audio going? Um, so, Nicholas, you still can't hear me because it sounds like Ashley and Crystal and Magic Hamster can hear me. Um, turn up your, your sound. Nicholas, and see what happens, because I think you're the only one who can't hear me uh, so far, as far as I can tell. As, as long as the sound is coming through clearly. Okay, we're good. So, loving this little guy here. The Japanese magic potions and the American line magic potions are a little bit different. I think the Japanese are a little smaller. Don't quote me on that, though. Um... I'm going to show you some of my American uh, Orange Dalmatian line magic potions in just a minute. So, yeah, this one's, you can see it pretty well. Let's see if we can look at some other individuals as well. I'd love to see if I can spot a baby for you. That would be fun. Oh, here's some adults. I love this one. Look at the yellow on that one. It's just fantastic. And, uh, <laughs> oh, Sorry to hear that in St. Isopods, that it was diseased. You found a red and gray one. It sounds kind of like a porcelain discovered lava, but it was diseased. That is sad. So this one on the right here is just, the markings are fabulous. That one plant guy. Oh, good way to get some panda kings. Awesome trade. The Bob Ross of isopods. Love it, Tony. It's pretty awesome. I've heard some people say that, which is fun. I always liked to watch Boss Bob Ross when I was a kid just because he was so positive and, and fun. Let's see. Do you think we'll be able to spot a couple of uh, monkai in here today? Like I said, I saw them the other day, so let's see what we can find. I don't, know, I'm not, I don't want to disturb anybody. Ooh. Just love the markings on this one specifically. It's got these neon yellow markings. So cool. Okay, let's see what it says. Yeah, happy trees. And what did he what did he say it was about the accidents? There are no no mistakes, just happy little accidents, I think is what he used to say. I see a ton of springtails there on the substrate. Maybe we can spot a tiny isopod, huh? Oh, I see one. I see one. Um I don't know if you can see it or not. Yep, it's right in the center of the screen. Oh, no, it's sort of in the center of the screen. Digging around in the substrate there. Very tiny. Okay, so Limberlost Exotics. This is Kyle says he brainstormed it with Jay Fiore. It refers to the milkiness of the yellow. It looks like it's been swirled into the white. That makes sense. They got that. That's cool. So, Sandy, there's the answer to your question, sounds like. That uh, milkiness of the yellow swirled into the white. There's a ton of them in here. Big adults. And I'm expecting, since generally when Armadillidium vulgare has babies, they, they don't fool around. They have a large number of babies. I'm hoping I have a large number of babies in there too. See, look at the, the big markings on this one. So, 
In Massachusetts, you can get Armadillo and Vulgari, Porcelio Scaber, Jonathan, Pilosky Muscorum, Meniscus Ocellus, and Cubaris Marina. Wild red calico and yellow calicos. That's awesome. It's my favorite invert for isopod. Look at the colors. This one is fantastic. Do, do the colors get any better than that? I don't know. For a, a magic potion. I mean, that's really good distribution. Some nice dark spotting. What do you say? Good isopod for an arid tank. Uh, I like Porcelionides prunosus as long as it still has some damp areas where it can hydrate. Because uh, you can't, uh, you know, they can't, they won't do well without some of those. But if you can have a couple of mossy spots under some rocks or cork bark, and they'll do pretty well. How long does it take for Monkai to reach maturity? Totally depends on the species. Um, with uh, magic potions, it can take a while. Uh, it can take a year, maybe more than a year, depending. How's the vinegaroon? Unfortunately, I lost my vinegaroon a while ago. So sad. I'm hoping to get another one at some point. Tip Top Taylor, my Volgari Gem Mix had babies a week ago. I'm so happy there's so many. Yeah, I have a ton of ton of Gem Mix now, babies. Very exciting. Um, I love Gem Mix. If you live in a dry area, I do. It's pretty dry here. Um, and Eileen O'Donnell, hi. Uh, Armadillidium Montenegro, I do have a couple of localities of those. Uh, well, I have a couple of localities of Armadillidium Klugai, Montenegro being one of them. Sorry, misspoke there. How much ventilation do you recommend for them? They need a decent amount. Um, I would say on the high side of ventilation, which isn't always as high as people think it is, to be honest, uh, but they need some good ventilation. I have some gasket, uh, you know, inch or two inch circles cut into the top of mine with some holes on the side as well. They, they do need it. They do need ventilation. It, not necessarily that much, but they need a decent amount. So Ashley in Neville, the, oh, it, it just moved, sorry, the, oh, product of my T plus albino and magic potion have been white vulgata with just yellow spots. Also gotten some yellows, but they may change. Interesting. That'll be fun to, to track the progress of that there. See, here's a young um, magic potion here, not, not a baby, I mean, I didn't get this, I didn't breed this one, this one I got with... My original groups, these are actually descended from two different groups, same line, different groups. And uh, that one has far fewer markings, although it does have some on it. So what would you do if Dwarf Whites got into a bin? Well, I actually did a video with uh, Supreme Gecko. I participated in a video that Wally, Supreme Gecko, did uh, recently, and we talked about that. So check out Wally's video for sure. Several other people chimed in too about Dwarf Whites in the bin, but I can talk about it. I don't have a problem talking about it. Um, so basically, I take isopods, the ones I want to remove, I take the, like, I take some orange vigors out. Oh, look, there's some baby magic potions on this piece of bark right here. These are orange Dalmatian magic potions. I'm not sure if these are descended from J. Fiore's line or if this was isolated separately. I have no idea there. You can see at least five babies right here of the magic potions. This is an orange Dalmatian magic potion. So... Not all the ones in here are, are orange, and I do know that the American line has some uh, more tendency to produce the kind of the ones with the red spots. So, like I said, I don't know where this particular line was originated, but you can see there's a bunch of babies in there. These are all orange Dalmatian magic potions. They're beautiful. See, there's a, an adult with lots of vivid yellow kind of babies here. Um, so Tony... Dwarf whites. I would take the adults of the ones and larger juveniles of the species I want to save, remove them from that bin, put them in a container with no substrate, with just paper towel that's damp for a while, use a magnifying glass, go through it, see if there's anything, you know, make sure there are no lingering uh, dwarf whites, and then move them into pristine substrate. Um, another thing that Orrin McMonagall says in his book to do is to, um, if the species that you're trying to save is cold hardy, 
Put the colony into the fridge overnight. The dwarf whites can't take it. But any cold hardy ice pods can. So that's what he says. I have not tried that particular method, but I have tried the previous method that I just mentioned. And it seems to work for me really well. I'm going to pull this one. It's a nice big adult. And it's also brilliantly colored. Fewer markings, but still, I would not call these red on this particular individual, at least not all the markings. They, they appear to be, you know, the dark gray markings, just like the other one. But this, the really vivid yellow on this one, I think this is the same individual I used in the thumbnail for this. So this is, like in the American Orange Dalmatian uh, Magic Potion, right here. So, let's see. Jacob, I have some Porcelius cable that burrow a lot, more active with it open. Does that mean they need more ventilation? Depends on how much ventilation you have. Usually Porcelius cable are pretty tolerant of low ventilation. They of course need oxygen, but they don't need a ton of ventilation. But they may be reacting to the lower humidity in the air with their activity, that's possible. But it doesn't necessarily mean they mean need more. You can usually use a Sterilite bin with no additional ventilation. Holes in it, just because it's not airtight for a Porcelius caber, but I generally put a little bit extra ventilation in there for them. How long does it take for Aniscus ocellus to mature? Fairly long time. They don't seem to reproduce until they get fairly large either. I mean, I've had them reproduce at uh, sizes that are smaller than adult size, and I think that tends to be true with lines that have been in captivity more possibly. I'm not entirely sure about that. But, uh, for example, my BC Maples Aniscus ocellus, which I'm not selling yet because I just got them not too long ago and they're still, you know, the colony still developed. Um, those seem to reproduce at smaller sizes than the wild caught strain that I have, even though I've had that strain. It's not wild caught. None of the individuals I have are wild caught, but I started with wild caught stock from bugs in cyberspace a number of years ago, probably around five years ago now. And uh, the, they usually don't reproduce until they're near adult size. Okay, so let's see. Nick Wills, DC Tarantulas. Do you raise Porcelio Hausai? That is a species I do not raise. I don't have a permit to receive it or to keep it or to sell it or anything. I love that species. I would love to keep it someday, so I hope I can uh, at some point. So Jackie Wolfie. Good starter ice pods that you could introduce to your giant African millipedes. My personal preference is to not keep any isopods with millipedes just because if one has a slight molting mishap and the isopods uh, the isopods will sense that and can attack the millipede even if it's a minor molting mishap that the millipede could have survived and healed through and corrected after a few molts the isopods will go after uh, a damaged molted millipede and so that's my my thoughts on the matter i would not put one in there just to be honest I know people do it. Some people do it with success, and I'm not, you know, not taking away from that. I know that people do it. It's just my personal uh, suggestion. If you were going to put one in there, I would put one in there that's not particularly protein hungry. Some so an armadillidium wouldn't be a bad idea. Something like one of these. So, Cookie Bro or Cokie Bro, have you ever owned Versicolor armadillidium? I haven't. They're pretty fantastic. Um, I would like to keep that species sometimes, but I don't have uh, I don't have a permit for that species, so I don't have it. So let's see. Is there a breeder of magic potions you recommend? I'm I'm not sure who's in stock right now. They are a little bit hard to keep in stock just because they're not the fastest breeders ever, and they're pretty popular and expensive. So I'm not sure who has any. Um, people like Wally of Supreme Gecko is a good person to go to. S Smugbug is another good one to go to. Um, Isopod Source, Isopod Farm, um, there are others. Those are some uh, companies I've had good success with with isopods, Captive Isopoda, but I'm not sure who has any in stock. So, And yeah, Arthropod Ambassadors, I know what you mean. These are just I, I used to wonder what the attraction was, honestly, on the Magic Potion, but the Magic Potion that I first had, I did start out with Magic Potion some time ago, 
they weren't nearly as colorful as these, to be honest. Uh, neither of the strains that I have. I have the Japanese strain and I have the American orange demolition strain, which is the one I'm looking at right now. Uh, I had another group of them. I started out with about half a dozen. I got them when they were small. They grew up and they, uh, they all grew up and they were about this size or so, maybe a little smaller. I don't know. They were, and they persisted for some time as adults and just gradually died off without reproducing at all. I think um, some strains can be male heavy. And I can never remember offhand if it's the Japanese strain or the American strain. I think it might be the American strain that's male heavy, but and I don't remember which one the one I had was, but I could have just gotten all males. So that's very possible. And now they don't, uh, and they never reproduced for me. Then I got into them again a few months ago, back in October, and now they're doing really well. Um, actually, these, this strain I got in November. These are the orange Dalmatians. Got these in November from two different sources, from Grim Smith and from Isopod uh, Farm at the same time, basically. And they, uh, no, wait. No, I think I just messed that up. I think it was Grim Schmidt and um, it was Bill, Billy. Billy. I want to make sure I give the right one. I got several orders at the same time, and I don't want to mess it up. But uh, these are much more brilliantly colored than those other ones that I had. Um, so, yeah, a lot of, Jonathan's right there, a lot of them have it these days. I'm checking it out. You know, I think this might be the highest number of uh, people we've ever had in a live stream, which I think is awesome. So thank you, everybody, for participating. Love it. Um, so crystals, pets, and plants. Can zebra isopods be with clown isopods, or is that a bad idea? I don't recommend keeping any mixed species isopods together because one tends to outcompete the other over time. I've seen it more than once. It does seem to happen. Sometimes it takes over a year, but it does happen in many cases. So I'm not saying there can't be any cases where it does, doesn't happen, but I wouldn't recommend it. A good question, Crystal. Uh, so Limberlost Exotics, good question about the um, cold hardiness of this species, or this morph, I would say. So Georgia, you know, is, as most of you probably know, unless maybe some of you out of state, out of the country, I'm not aware of this as much. Here's a different one. Um, Georgia is, much of it has a fairly mild climate. Some parts of it have cooler climate, but it's warm enough so that, um, you know, most of the state, a large part of the state at least, has alligators and things like that. So it's, uh, but there are parts where it definitely freezes. I mean, I'm not saying it's not, doesn't get cold, but there are places where it's more mild than where I live, for example. So um, I'm not sure about that. I, when I got mine, Mine came with dairy cows, if I remember correctly, dairy cows, and I think powder oranges, and um, my originals that eventually died off after they grew up. And they, that package got lost in the mail and in December without a heat pack, and everybody was fine. I didn't have any fatalities. So take that for what it's worth. But of course, strains that have been in captivity for a while, and let's look at some. These are Sinella curvus at a spring tails, everybody, while we're... Checking things out. Looks like all the, or most of the baby isopods that were on there have vacated the premises, but the springtails are still there. Let's see if we can see any more here. There's there's a little.
Okay. How's this? Am I back? Sorry about that, everybody. Um, hopefully it's working. Just let me know as soon as you hear me, if you hear me. I guess I don't need these anymore. Um, all right. How's this? We're back. Okay. Yeah, maybe I do need the glasses right now. All right. Well, we're done with uh, looking at the ice pods right now because my camera is freaking out. But you can look at me. It's not as fun, but uh, I'm here. So there you go. Okay, so Bride Deep 89. Yeah, dwarf whites are cold sensitive. And it's possible that that's what's going on. I, I don't know for sure with the situation, but it, it could be that's what's going on. And okay, we're back. I see invertebrate dudes in the house too. Okay. Glad, glad you can hear me again. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> yes, this is this is a very rare appearance of my species, a spectacled dress. Actually, uh, just recently, and I think it's partly spurred on by the fact that I'm in front of a screen a lot more with COVID going on, that uh, my eyes have decided to do what eyes do and uh, just need a little help with some uh, just reading glasses once in a while. So I'm doing that more when I'm looking at uh, close-up things, especially isopods. So Jackie Wolfie says, I saw yourself in Clint's video on the Blue Death Fanning Beetle and loved it. Now I really want a couple. Thanks for the millipede advice too. Well, thank you, Jackie, for the super chat. I really appreciate that. That is awesome. And uh, I'm glad you appreciated that video. It was a lot of fun to make. As uh, many of you probably know, I'm a big Clint's Reptiles fan myself. I love his videos and love working with him. And I'm excited to do more collaborations with him. We've done three so far. Uh, just if you haven't seen them, just to give you a heads up on my channel, the first one we posted was on my channel. It was about Madagascar hissing cockroaches, the best pet invertebrate. So we did that one on my channel. And then uh, we did the tailless whip scorpion, best pet invertebrate on his channel. And then we just recently, just this past week, released the um, blue death finning beetle one on his channel. And we're going to film two more in the next couple of weeks. So I'm really excited for that. He's so much fun to work with. Um, he is even more fun, if you can believe it, in real life than he is on camera. Because he's a ton of fun in his videos, obviously. Live streams, um, pre-recorded videos, doesn't matter. He's a ton of fun. But he's even more fun in person. And his reptile room is an amazing place. I've been there a couple of times now. Uh, once just to visit the reptile room with my uh, sons. And another time to uh, record. And just a fabulous place. So there you go. Let's see. And that's true about the cocoa fiber. It, it, it will eventually kind of solidify. I don't know what's going on, if that's fungal growth in there or uh, what it is, but it does do that. So Leon from Dubai. Nice. Hydration for Porcelio powder blue isopods. Is there any other way to hydrate them without using moss? Moss is pretty expensive. Here. Okay. Well, one... Um, powder blue isopods are actually porcelionides, uh, pruinosis, but, you know, they're, uh, the name is a little bit similar, so I can understand that. Uh, you don't need to use moss. I like moss. I actually uh, started doing that based on what Supreme Gecko did because I used, but, but I kept colonies for years without moss. Let me tell you, it works fine without moss, but it is more difficult to do without moss or I should say maybe it's just easier to do with moss. It's easier because it keeps the hydration longer and it keeps it more localized. So I like the moss. I use the moss. I appreciate the benefits of the moss, but I did it for years without it. Can be done without it. Just keep one side more humid. You can just keep some leaf litter in that area and keep it humid and um, just make sure that you keep a dry side and a moist side and you'll be fine. So John Racine, uh, magic potions require... Uh, Probably a little less humidity than some of the more humidity-loving ones like uh, rubber duckies. They still need a moist spot all the time. But they do need more ventilation than, say, rubber duckies or Procelio scaver. Oh, T Richard from the Tarantula Collective just did a $5 super chat. <laughs> Hair looking more red than usual. Thank you. I, I think it has to do with uh, I've got a light that has more natural light that brings out the red tones in my hair. So um, 
when I was a kid, my hair always looked like this. And as I've gotten older, it doesn't look quite like this all the time, but uh, you get the right light and it does. So, yeah, thank you. Um, Nicholas is asking, how old my sons are? My oldest son is uh, going to be 22. That's crazy. Uh, really soon. And my younger son is 19. And they both enjoyed the reptile room a lot. We got a lot of pictures of everybody holding snakes and things. It was fun. Okay, invertebrate dude, that totally makes sense. Uh, the coconut fiber comes with leucocoprinus, mycelium spores. Stuff starts growing. It turns the subject into solid fungal mat that eventually die out. Mm, that makes sense. Same goes for potting soil and sphagnum peat. Totally makes sense. Thank you for the scientific name on that stuff. I was curious about that. And insane isopods. Yeah, it makes sense that you collected all those in the in the winter and then you put them in the warmth and they started breeding. They probably thought it was spring. That's true. Um, Handel S. Was there ever an ice spot or exotic species that gave you a real challenge that gave you a better understanding you didn't have before? Dwarf, uh, not dwarf. Um, rubber duckies. Those were tough for me. Uh, to be honest, I had a die off and I didn't lose all of them. But when I first got them, they did fine, no deaths for months and months, but no reproduction. And then they started dying off and I lost most of them, had a few left, put them in a smaller container. I think that increased the humidity. I think that was part of my problem. I had uh, the humidity was a little low for them and they started breeding in the small container and then started moving them up into bigger containers. And now I have a good number of them. I The last time I checked, I had somewhere between 30 and 50 of them. So they've been doing well. And I did buy a few more. Sorry, let me shut that alarm off. It shouldn't be going off. Um, so there you go. Hopefully that answered that question a little bit. Okay, that's a good tip, invertebrate dude. Heat sterilizing to kill those uh, mycelia. That makes sense. Would I be an orange peacekeeper or would I be a powder orange? Or maybe Porcelia magnificus. I don't know. You know, I don't know. So the bird, he's in the other room right now. Um, he has often joins in the streams. Since he's not in the stream, let's, uh, let's bring in a leopard gecko because we do that sometimes, right? Here's a leopard gecko whose home is right next to the computer here. So say hi, Pago. This is Pago, our leopard gecko we've had for many years. She shares her enclosure with Porcelionides prunosus as a cleanup crew. Has for years. They do really well there. I did put uh, zebra isopods in there at first, and for a year and a half, they did okay with the Porcelionides prunosus. But the Porcelionides prunosus eventually outcompeted them. You know, some more research on how temperatures affect isopod breeding is probably in order. We need some of that. So that one plant guy, I have never kept panda kings, so I'm not sure. I would go ahead and add the limestone. It seems to benefit a lot of the tropical cubaris, but uh, that's just me. That's, that would be my guess. So Jonathan, I don't keep any bat guano with my powder or with my rubber duckies, but I do use limestone chunks, definitely. So Nicholas, I actually show yeah my bird on camera. It's a Melopsicotus undulatus, which is uh, known as the parakeet or the budgie. It's a budgie rigger. That's an Australian bird, uh, of course, captive bred. But yeah, uh, so often called the parakeet. Parakeet is kind of a larger group, so I prefer the term budgie because there are many different species of parakeets, but budgie is just one species. So clognog, how would isopods do with dubia roaches in a cocoa fiber substrate tank? You know, I've never kept dubia roaches, but I've heard people keeping isopods with dubia roaches and then it can go really well, but I've never done it, so I'm not sure. Hmm. So Ashley, Ashley Neville, Insights or opinions on offering isopods mineral salt licks like you would give a rodent. I've been doing some research. Some say yes, salt. Some say salt kills them. Well, I will tell you what I have 
heard. I have not tried any min mineral salt lake, so I take this with a grain of salt. <laughs> Sorry, that was awful. But uh, isopod keeping as uh, people keeping isopods as bioactive cleanup crew, this was pioneered by two different groups. And I don't honestly know which was first, although I suspect it was the uh, dart frog community. But the dart frog community and the uh, hermit crab keeping community, interestingly enough, were the first people to have information about isopods as bioactive cleanup crew members. And this was a long time ago, long before you know most people were keeping isopods as pets or anything like that. They were keeping them with hermit crabs and dart frogs. Um, hermit crabs... The terrestrial hermit crabs, Cenobita clypeatus, uh, this is the Caribbean hermit crab. This species needs to be able to osmoregulate by having access to salt. And in many cases, this is best provided by giving them a salt water pool as well as a freshwater pool. But sometimes people would just put salt in the sand. They would pour salt water over the sand, or sometimes they would just put a little dish of salt in there. And in those situations, even when they put salt into the sand, a lot of people found that their isopods thrived in those situations with the hermit crabs. So I think at least some species may be somewhat salt tolerant, but I would shy away from it. I feel like isopods generally get a lot of minerals from the food they're eating, especially if you're offering things like fish-based foods uh, or fish meal-based foods like fish food pellets like I offer or things like shrimp dried shrimp, which I also offer, and they probably don't, and then you, you know, ground eggshell, of course, things like that. You probably don't need uh, a salt lick, so I haven't offered one, and I do think, you know, they could easily dry out if uh, they had access to too much salt, so that's kind of what I would say. Hopefully that helps. Mm, let's see. So, oh, Tarantula Collective. Richard, I'm nervous that my rubber ducky isopod is, enclosure is too damp. Is that possible? Yes, it is. Could be. Um, I would say it's, you know, they can they can tolerate a good deal of dampness, but there's other issues going on. Like you could get anaerobic substrate depending on the composition of the substrate and the depth of the substrate and so on. And that could be a problem for them. So um, maybe kind of a secondary issue and that the dampness itself might not be a problem, but side effects of the dampness could be a big issue. So I would still recommend giving them a, a moisture gradient, and I do for mine. I just make sure their moisture gradient is a little more moist than some others, and then make sure that uh, the ventilation is not too high. So hopefully that helps. Great question, Richard. Leopard gecko's name is Pago, which is Hindi for run, I believe. And... Uh, it was named because this uh, little gecko, when she was little, uh, ran a lot. Of course, now she's calmed down quite a bit, but when she was little. And invertebrate dude, I agree with the coconut fiber. Uh, coconut fiber I used for years with my isopods, and as long as they have leaf litter and other nutritious items, I didn't have a problem with it. Um, it's not my favorite uh, because I think others work a little bit better, but... It does work fine, in my opinion, too. I agree. It's just not the best. And are armadillidium more cold sensitive than Lavis? I think it depends more on this individual species than it does on the, the genus, to be honest. And I would have to go find where the bird is. I think he's in my daughter's room because he's her bird. Uh, and then I'd have to leave. And it might take a while to find him because he might be in another room with my daughter or something like that. And Limberlos Exotics, good point, that the Cubaris may just be feast, feasting on a, like a biofilm that grows on the limestone. Interesting. Wild powder blues, and I noticed some purple and red individuals. Do you think I can breed this strain true? One plant guy. It depends. Um, good question. Now, purple in isopods can sometimes be a sign of aridivirus in reddish or orangish individuals, and that's scary. And, well, not so scary in that you might lose all your isopods to infection because 
it doesn't seem to be terribly contagious, but it does seem to kill the individuals that have it. So if that's where you're getting the purple, then that's scary, but uh, for the individuals, mm, it may not be what's going on. The red individuals, on the other hand, uh, that is more likely to be something you could isolate. So it's worth trying. And oh, there's Jay Fiore. He's the one, he's in the chat. He is the one who collected and began working with the first um, magic potion. So he's the one who brought magic potions to the hobby. So everybody should thank Jay Fiore for doing that and thank him for uh, allowing us to use the photos that were near that beginning of the stream and for the uh, information that I provided about the origin of the American line of magic potions. That's, that's Jay right there, FP Fiore. So thank you, Jay. Really appreciate it. Oh, this alarm. I thought I had fixed that. So, so Limberlost, that's interesting. You keep one to two dubia roaches in your isopod cultures. This is a cleanup crew for your isopods, uh, rather different from the other direction uh, where people use isopods for a dubia roach cleanup. That's awesome. I love that. Um, let's see. I'm, I'm catching up now. I'm trying to. Let's see. Fan is starting to breed blue death fanning beetles soon. Got the incubator and everything. Have a female and a male. That's enough to get started. And excellent. Glad that was helpful, Ashley. Wild grasshoppers and worms to captive animals. Would boiling get rid of any illnesses in the feeders? Well, uh, though there there is some potential for issues there. Um, I know that, for example, Peter at Bugs in Cyberspace has been keeping lots of critters for a long time. And he will use wild caught insects for a lot of his creatures and has never had any deaths attributable to that. Um, I have used wild caught uh, feeders for certain things like my jumping spiders. I'll go outside and catch them a fly uh, and give it to them. And I haven't had problems with that either. But um, I tend to avoid using things like wild grasshoppers to give to my reptiles. I, I do avoid that generally. Um, so that one plant guy, you'll probably be okay with the powder orange in your uh, purple pincher or every crab tank. Uh, Florida Fast seems to work well. Um, Brian Davidson bought some uh, Florida Fast from me and put them in with his um, hermit crabs. They were doing really well in there. Oh, it looks like someone answered your question about the coconut coir, um, Ashley. Jonathan, isolating orange pied prunosis. Awesome. Yeah, and invertebrate dude, yeah, I, I would tend to agree that coconut fiber and coconut core seem to be used interchangeably. It's the same. Uh, same stuff as far as I know. And thank you, Jay. I, I'm really glad that you were able to, you were able and willing to get back to me and give me so much information and the great pictures. So if you haven't seen the pictures at the beginning of this uh, live stream, make sure you check them out. Uh, he had some really cool isopods that he collected, and some of which turned into the magic potion strain, and some of which were unable to be isolated. But there's, they're all cool, so it's worth a look at the beginning of the stream, or beginning of the stream. And Noah, this is Pago. What is all of the animals you have, Jay Marion? <laughs> hmm, that would take a while, but. Uh, it's out of date now, but I do have a 15,000 subscriber video which shows a lot of the creatures that I have. It doesn't show all of them, especially the isopods have been updated since then. But uh, now that I have 40,000 subscribers plus, I need to do another one at some point and get into that. Uh, so that one plant guy. Possible. A lot of times lighter individuals have to do with 
uh, how much of the waxy coating they have on them, how dry they are, different things like that can change. Uh, they have this kind of waxy um, CT sort of thing going on on their carapace, and that uh, can change based on humidity and, and different things. You might be able to, though. It depends on whether it's actually genetic mutation or it's just that that I was mentioning about observing. So Wally, Supreme Gecko, do you or have you ever fed mushrooms to your pods? Yes, and they seem to like it a lot. So do the springtails. Uh, I have done that. I've never collected wild mushrooms to do it, but I have given them mushrooms that I purchased, like uh, organic mushrooms that I've washed. And life with Omar and the animals. Hello. Welcome. Um, do I have crested geckos? Yeah, yeah, we've got three crested geckos. So Rebelicious, um, you should be able to get um, Phidippus regius in Florida. If you can't catch it, you should be able to get it shipped to you because it is native to your state. So I would imagine. So that one plant guy, local crickets. So I'm wondering what your local crickets are. I know in parts of the US, when I was in California, for example, banded crickets were everywhere at a place I stayed at. So. Uh, but you might be dealing with a different species. You might be dealing with uh, field crickets or something like that. Um, I have, I think I've bred field crickets. It's been years, but uh, basically they just need a substrate where they can put their eggs and something to keep them from digging down and eating the eggs. So if you look at my cricket breeding video, I, I think you could breed most species of crickets you'd find with uh, that. I mean, unless you're looking at camel crickets or something like that, it might be a little different. Let's see. Kalama cow. Would a 20 gallon long aquarium be large enough to sustain a large group of death fending beetles? Think of keeping them with some iron clads and bilbin ants in a large desert enclosure. Sure. You could, I mean, it depends on how large is large. If you're talking 400, of course, then no, probably not. But if you're thinking 15, 20, yeah, and then you don't have a ton of other beetles in there and not a ton of other relevant ants, but say if you had half a dozen velvet ants in there, 15 or 20 death fending beetles and half a dozen ironclad beetles, you could do that. And I'm not saying that's the exact number you need to do. You could probably get, get away with more of more than that, as long as you had plenty of hiding places and things to climb on. And, uh, oh, Jay, oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, send me a message and we can set, set you up with some Opiola for sure. No problem. <laughs> okay. And Sandy, great question. Thank you for uh, basically stimulating the uh, first topic we discussed. We talked about uh, magic potions for quite a while at the beginning of the stream and answered your question with some interesting uh, information that I found out very, very recently, in fact, today. So uh, your question stimulated some research, and I was able to get uh, the originator of the American line of magic potions to give us some information on that. So check out the beginning of the stream, and you will find out you get some good answers, hopefully. So Ashley, currently, we only have a cat for mammals. Uh, I have kept uh, other species of mammal. I've kept most of the rodents. I've kept rabbits. Uh, I used to breed sugar gliders. I used to breed hamsters, uh, things like that. So I've had rats. I love rats. I'm one of my favorite mammals ever. We did have a dog at one point, too. Um, that was years, years ago. So we've had... Uh, a number of mammals over the years, but now just a cat. Um, the cats don't really have a fascination with the isopods, but I notice that our corn snake uh, loves to dig. If I'm working with isopod substrate and he's climbing around on me, he'll love to climb into the, the isopod bins when I'm uh, replacing substrate. So he gets into it. Cat, not so much. So do I have blue death fending beetles to share? Someone was asking for some. Not currently. I'm not producing them in large numbers yet. 
I don't know if I'll ever get there, but I do hope to get some out the, into the hobby, some captive bred ones. But right now, basically, I'm figuring out the best way to produce larger numbers of them and working on the substrates that uh, stimulate better growth for the uh, larvae and different things like that. And just kind of nailing down uh, the best ways to to get them to pupate to, and so on. Still working on that, but uh, hopefully I will eventually have some. So Jonathan, about the orange creams, Prunosis. Uh, to be honest, the other day I took the project and I put it in with some some whites because I want to turn it into some whiteouts um, all together in a separate you know bin that's just for this mix because I want to make uh, one that has orange cream, uh, Oreo crumbles, wild types, oranges, and whiteouts. Um, I want a, a little container that I can have at work that has all of those in it, like a, a party mix. So that's what I decided to do. I am going to be getting some orange creams coming up fairly soon. So that's why I decided to do that. Hmm, let's see. So invertebrate dudes. Yeah, I can actually find the Jerusalem kick crickets here um, up in the canyons near my house. I haven't seen um, haven't seen one for a while. In fact, I don't know if I've ever seen one in the wild, but I know people who have sent me pictures of them that they find while they're hiking and they send me a picture and I say, oh, that's a Jerusalem cricket. Uh, but I, th I would like to keep one. I think they're cool. But I have never actually found one here. I found them in other state. I found one in California. Flipped one there once, and you know. But yeah, they're very cool. And I S, I think that says I have not crossed dairy cows with any other morph. I haven't tried all the morphs. I've heard that you can cross them with milkbacks, but I don't really want to because then you'd get some confusing specimens. It might be hard to tell what they are. I was trying to mix them with uh, the oranges, and that didn't work. And I've tried mixing the oranges with milkbacks, and that hasn't worked yet. But uh, yeah, I, I'm sure that there, there's something interesting going on there, but I haven't discovered what it is yet. And thank you, John Racine, for joining in. Appreciate it. Large projects or plans to expand a current project in the hobby. I've got a lot of irons in the fire, I guess I could say. And I'm hoping I've got some secret stuff that I want to reveal to you fairly soon. Hmm. I have had, America, had the African clawed frogs crystal. They're pretty cool frogs. Um, can, okay, Ashley Neville. Camel crickets, spider crickets, shoot me a message sometimes. They're pests in my in-laws cabin in northern Wisconsin. Cool, that might be fun. And Gloria Dawson, rats are the best. That's true. I, I miss our rats. I've had several over the years, and it's been a while since we've had any, but they're awesome. And Rebelicious. Yeah, dairy cows are hard to beat for just prolific masses. Um, they, there are some others that might breed just as fast, but the fact that they're so large and so active makes it uh, especially impressive. All right, everyone. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining in. I have to go film, but we've had a really great turnout today. We've had some great super chats. And thank you again, Sandy Sizemore, for your question that... Uh, gave us the impetus for the beginning of this uh, episode. And if you want to know more about the origins of the American line of Magic Potion Armadillidium vulgari, and you missed the beginning of the stream, go ahead and check that out. It's pretty cool. Thank you to Jay Fiore for the information and the photos that we used at the beginning of the stream. So have a great night, everyone, and keep uh, an eye out for Friday's video and keep an eye out for the collaboration videos that are going to be coming out with uh, Clint's Reptiles in the next few months. Right, thanks again for joining, and we'll catch you all later. Stay safe and stay healthy.